Hello and good evening. My name is Josh Brumberg. I'm the Dean for the Sciences here at the Graduate Center. When thinking about the pandemic, we are all looking for silver linings. One such example is tonight's web webinar, where I can welcome a much larger crowd online than what we could have hosted in person at the Graduate Center for this important discussion about the natural world we encounter every day as we walk around our urban ecosystems. As a public university, the Graduate Center and its associated Advanced Science Research Center are committed to the idea that our scientific research has a role in advancing the public good. To help us understand urban ecosystems and how flora and fauna have adapted to the cities we live in, I'm very happy to introduce tonight's panel. First is Dr. Jesse Allen, who is a graduate of our biology program in plant sciences and is an assistant professor of botany at Eastern Washington University. Her interests range from how fungi evolve to how we can better conserve the species of plants and lichens that we cohabitate the earth with. Next up is Dr. Andrew Ryman, who is an assistant professor in the Environmental Science Initiative at the Advanced Science Research Center and a member of the geology department at Hunter College and the PhD program in Earth and Environmental Sciences here at the Graduate Center. His research focuses on how environmental change such as urbanization impacts carbon cycling in plants. Our next panelist is an associate curator in the Institute of Systematic Bio Botany at the New York Botanical Gardens and both a graduate and now faculty member of the Graduate Center's Plant Science PhD program, Dr. James Lendemer. His research focuses on the biodiversity within lichens and how to better preserve the, this species of fungi. And I should say he and uh, Jesse have a great book coming out on lichens if you're looking for a stock, stocking stuffer this Christmas season. Our final panelist is Dr. Jessica Ware, an assistant curator at the American Museum of Natural History and an assistant professor in the Associated Richard Gilder Graduate School and the Graduate Center's Program in Ecology, Evolution, and Behavior. Dr. Ware's research focuses on the adaptations that insects such as dragonflies and roaches have made to ensure their continued survival. Dr. Ware is currently the president of the Entomological Society of America. Finally, a few words about how tonight's event will unfold. I will lead our panelists in discussion, and I'm sure many of you will have questions, which I invite you to submit via the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom window. And we will do our best at the end of the evening to answer as many of the questions as we can get to. And now, without further ado, we're gonna get on to our event. So first of all, panelists, welcome. And I wanna start this, uh, this evening out with a little uh, thought project. Many of our panelists, whether uh, local or from far away, have had the pleasure of walking through Central Park. And when you're walking through Central Park, what do you see in terms of the, the plants, the insects, and uh, the animals as you walk around? Why don't we start off alphabetically and I'll start with you, Jesse. Okay, great. So we'll start with the lichens, which of course I love that option. So, okay. So before you even leave your apartment, um, I would recommend grabbing some sort of magnification. So if you have a hand lens or magnifying glass, lichens are best enjoyed um, with a, you know, a little bit closer view. So take that with you. Um, and once you're in the park, I invite you to slow down uh, and take a look, uh, starting with the bark on the trees. So take a closer look at these trees. And actually from this distance, we can already start to see some lichens here. Uh, there are these lovely uh, gray green patches on the bark. Now, if you take your hand lens at this point and um, take an even closer look, you might see something like this, this really beautiful, diverse community. Um, we can appreciate the colors and the shapes and the sizes and the textures here of these lichens. And the three most common species that you're likely to see on uh, bark in Central Park are shown here. So we have the common green shield. This is Flavo parmelia caparata. We have the candle flame. Candelaria concolor, and spangled rosette. Uh, so that is Fissia milligrana. Then I would recommend uh, moving on and 
uh, taking a look at some of the stonework or cement in the park. And here you'll see a whole nother host of species. Uh, two of my favorites are smoky eyes here. This is Porpidia albocerulescens and sidewalk fire dots. This is Caloplaca ferraxissima. You can also check things like benches and fences and soil. Basically, take a look at every different surface that you can find, and there is a potential that a lichen inhabits it. Um, so I always like to say they're hiding in plain sight, and they are all around you most of the time. Now, if you really took your time here, you could end up seeing well over 30 different species of lichens in Central Park alone. Um, and then if you were looking throughout New York City, um, you that, well, we're up to over 100 species documented. So I recently um, published the first attempt at a checklist of lichens for New York, uh, the first attempt in about a century. I found 106 species at that time. Uh, subsequent research, uh, you know, we've, well, we've found that there are even more. So you could even have the potential to find another species that we didn't know about. Um, now, we can appreciate what lichens look like here, right? Um, and start to get a sense of what they might be. But, you know, for a long time, scientists didn't really understand fundamentally what lichens were. Um, they were grouped with plants initially, then maybe somebody thought it was a fungus. Um, and it actually took quite a while until the late 1800s for scientists to figure out what they actually are. And then even longer for people to accept that theory. And so, as Jesse alluded to, lichens have been an object of mystery and allure for centuries. Uh, if you've tried to identify one on a walk through Central Park or really any other part of the city, you've probably been just as vexed as many scientists were in the past. Uh, in fact, even though some of them may appear leafy and greenish, they aren't plants. Uh, rather, they're fungi that enter into symbioses, so intimate and permanent relationships with algae and cyanobacteria photosynthesizing organisms uh, in order to obtain nutrition and survive. Uh, it's a unique lifestyle that's been that's evolved in fungi and the symbioses that lichens form are really both complex and beautiful. I think as our photographs here show and as any walk through the city will also reveal. So anyone that's seen a carpet of sort of fungal mycelium, you know, be it in their shower or on the soil in a forest <laughs> and a smudge of green algae uh, on a wet tree or a rock has to agree that the form of the lichen is astonishingly different from the constituent members if they were to grow on their own. So if we peered inside a lichen like this one, a sea storm lichen that I photographed in the Great Smoky Mountains where I've done a lot of work, you'd see that there's layers of fungal tissue that in case a layer where the fun that um, in case a layer where the fungus is intermixed with the algal partner, uh, when you see a lichen growing in nature, you have to imagine that there's a tiny world living in plain sight. It's more than just a fungus and an alga. Instead, uh, as this illustration by CUNY PhD student Jordan Hoffman shows, uh, there's a vast microcosm of bacteria, fungi, and even microinvertebrates like water bears or tardigrades uh, living inside. That's pretty cool. So, but Andy, I bet when you were uh, walking along, you were more interested in the bark of the tree than maybe the, the lichens living besides it. Well, I mean, yes, and um, I'm one of the uh, field trips I take my class on, they spend a lot of time in Central Park with hand lenses peering down at, at lichens growing on rocks and on and on and on bark. Um, but um, yeah, so I'm I'm a forest ecologist. So um, I guess first and foremost, when I take a walk through through Central Park, I'm kind of seeing seeing the trees. Um, and so here's what Central Park might look like if you were looking at it from above this time of year. Um, and it's uh, I mean Central Park to me is a really amazing place that kind of emulates a lot of what New York City is. Um, first, it's it's big for as far as parks go. It's over 840 acres. And just like the city, it's incredibly diverse. Um, there's over 270 bird species that can be found throughout the park at different times of the year. Some of these are uh, sort of year round inhabitants. Others are just sort of passing through, much like the way people kind of use Manhattan in New York City. Um, 
But of course, Central Park is kind of this land of, of trees. And I guess, as we know now too, those trees are helping to support some of those lichen communities that, that we find. Um, and the tree diversity is also really incredible. There's uh, about 180 different tree species that you can find in Central Park. Um, also like the city itself, these trees are from all over the world. Um, and Central Park was built with a lot of intentionality. Um, it has, in some ways, it, it, parts of it look like a natural landscape, but almost every square inch of Central Park had a vision, um, some sort of intention by, by its, its creators. Um, and just some examples here, this area in the northern part of the park is co called the Northwoods. Um, the vision by Olmsted was to have people walking through the Northwoods feel like they were walking through someplace much further north, like in the Adirondacks. Um, and so there's dense, lush forest there. There's running water through there, streams and waterfalls. And the idea, again, was to kind of transport the visitor out of New York City and into kind of these more wild places. Um, further south, we can see that there's, um, of course, there's, there's baseball fields, but there's these little patches of trees. There's, there's trees growing sort of along roadways. Um, and so we kind of get this kind of myriad of different treescapes, I guess, uh, ranging from what we would all kind of uh, agree is, is a forest to things that are kind of something in between. So we have these areas that are kind of like not quite forest, not quite street trees, these almost savanna-like landscapes that, that exist. Um, and then we have these more manicured um, malls. So here's uh, a very famous part of Central Park, the, the mall that, that has um, one of the most magnificent groves of, of American elm trees that are still in existence that we put a lot of work into making sure they don't, don't succumb to uh, introduced uh, pathogens. Um, and then if you're walking along sort of the edges of the park, you might come across these um, pretty wide sidewalks and, and street trees. Um, as a, as, an, as a forest ecologist coming into the city, you sort of have to scratch your head a little bit and say, okay, well, how do we characterize what, what a forest is in, in an urban area? It's easy to do when you're, you know, 50, 60 miles north of the, of the city and, and you have these larger expanses of forest, but what do you do in the city? Um, so what we kind of do is we just sort of collectively call all of the trees in the forest sort of the urban canopy. Um, and, and that would include what we would more conventionally think of as, as a forest, like in this image, and then sort of everything in between forest and, and the street trees. Um, but it's, it's sort of this, again, this, this myriad of treescapes um, being intermixed with different types of open habitat that create this massive amount of, of habitat diversity that helps to support um, uh, the enormous number of birds that wind up flying through this area. In fact, um, not only is it good birding by city standards, people come from all over the United States and all over the world to go, to go birding here. Um, some of the other things that, that, that I think about walking through here um, are you know, so we have these sort of more natural looking forests and these much more kind of anthropogenically driven treescapes. And as I think we'll talk about a little bit later in our conversation today, all of these can have different impacts on, on the trees, these organisms that inhabit these landscapes and also kind of the, the ways that these ecosystems and these organisms are then influencing the city and the people that are also using uh, these landscapes. All right, thank you, Andrew. It looks like Jessica might have. Uh, oh, she's she's coming back to us. So, um, we'll see if Jessica could join us because we're going to get an idea uh, from her. But we'll, we'll wait a second. But I guess one of the things that I was struck by looking at uh, Andrew's uh, beautiful image there of Central Park is the uh, abrupt transition from cement to uh, a living environment. And have uh, the different species or organisms uh, adapted to, to living in uh, this type of environment, or uh, could they have done that all along? I don't know if anyone who wants to get that. I can well, start. Maybe... Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Jessica. Go ahead, Jessica. Sorry, my video went off for a second with my internet. You're in, you're in Jersey. Um, I would just say, you know, maybe 
I know that plants are quite old and some of the other things that people have talked about are quite old, uh, but I study insects and insects are very old, uh, uh, you know, 400 million years of flight. Um, and so they've kind of been around for a lot longer than much of our urban environment. Um, but insects are really good at, at, um, at invading places um, and they're really good at hitchhiking and uh, they can make use of any kind of local environment. So there are lots of dragonflies, which is what I mostly work on. Um, and uh, they are really good at breeding in almost anything. Uh, the surface of a of a car can look like water to them and they'll try and lay their eggs on the surface of people's cars. Um, but also even just, you know, small puddles and ephemeral pools um, kind of can build up in, in, in parts of the park. And those are great habitats. So um, they when we think of dragonflies and damselflies, sometimes we think of really pristine, you know, clean flowing water uh, or, or, or large, you know, lentic habitats or still waters like lakes. Uh, well, these guys can be in puddles too <laughs> and next to the sewer and they do just fine. Not all species are, are tolerant of that, but many of them do just, just fine. I mean, are there species of trees, Andrew, that you just kind of scratch your head? Like, how does this thing survive 20 feet from a high rise? <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, I think that with, with, a, with a lot of trees. And, um, you know, I, one of the interesting things about, I guess, trees in cities is, is some of them sort of find their own way there and others we intentionally plant. And, um, you know, over you know, the last couple of hundred years, we've learned to intentionally plant trees that we know will do well in areas of maybe small amounts of growing space in the case of a street tree or tolerant of, of high pollution levels. Um, in increasingly so, we start thinking about what types of trees are, are tolerant of the, the hot and dry conditions that often exist in, in cities. Um, and you know some some trees like one of our more common trees that we'll see growing along our streets is a, is a London plane tree, um, which is which is sort of a, a, a hybrid of, of a couple of different species. And one of the, the, the thoughts for why these trees seem to do particularly well in cities um, is if, if you've ever seen these trees, I should have uh, gotten a picture of them, but they have this, they almost look like sycamore trees. They have this um, really light, smooth green bark higher up on the canopy. And then it turns to a more brownish color lower down on the stem and it peels off in these large pieces. And, and one of the thoughts for how that helps these trees to do well in cities is that um, all trees have these little pores in their bark uh, called lenticels that are really important for exchanging uh, air between the outside environment and the living cells inside the tree stem. In um, highly polluted areas, those little pores can get clogged up by particulate matter and things like that. And so London plane trees just shed big pieces uh, or peels of their bark. And it's, it's possible that in, by doing that, they're also kind of shedding some of that pollution off of them, which at least you know, in the earlier days of cities, when they, then there was a lot more particular matter pollution than there is today, would have been a real advantage because they could sort of maintain that, that flow of gases inside the, the stem and, and outside. Um, some of the other things that, that trees do that um, are a bit of a pain to people managing cities is they're looking for water. When you plant a tree on the street, um, you may wonder sometimes how is this tree that is 50 feet tall and has a stem almost as wide as the little area it's planted in, how is that surviving? Um, what we've been finding, not me personally, but sort of the scientific community, is that um, their roots are really good, certain species more so than others, at just finding um, uh, water to scavenge in the urban environment. So New York City, like all cities, have tons of water pipes going underground and they leak sometimes and the trees are really good. Their roots are really good at finding those leaks and starting to grow the roots into water pipes, which can then further exacerbate whatever crack was there to begin with. Um, so trees can be really good at scavenging um, our waste, maybe a lot like some of the, the insects or other animals that are, that are living in, 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 in the cities. Um, in, in sort of more natural areas of, of forest, um, uh, there's a couple of particular problems. Of course, there, there's invasive species, 
But the other uh, potential problem is that we seem to be getting poor regeneration of things like oak trees, which is um, once you get outside the city is one of the most common types of trees in our, in our native forest. But we don't get very good uh, regeneration of oak trees um, in the city. And one of the possible reasons is that all of their acorns are getting eaten by um, really high densities of squirrels. Um, so in, in rural forests, our, our squirrels, their populations will go up and down um, as interannual variations in acorn production change. So oaks are called masking species. So they'll uh, flood this ecosystem with huge amounts of acorns you know, every few years. And this is synchronized across oak trees in a forest and even a region to do this at the same time. They do this so that the squirrels and other animals that are there can't possibly eat all of the acorns and that ensures their survival. The problem in cities is that um, when squirrels aren't able to get enough acorns, they'll feed on um, human related sources of food, whether it's bird feeders or trash or something like that. And so they're able to maintain these constantly high populations, right? So that kind of presents this challenge to these trees that maybe they don't have in quite the same way in, in rural areas. So those are, I guess, just a few examples of maybe some of the ways that trees can deal with these urban conditions and some of the things that they, uh, that they have to deal with that they maybe aren't evolved to. So uh, Jessica made the point that dragonflies can be fooled by, say, the blue paint on a car and try to lay their, their nest, their, their eggs there. Are, are lichens fooled? Uh, Jesse or James, or do they have a preference? Do some lichens prefer the park bench versus the tree versus the rock? Or uh, are we gonna start seeing them on hubcaps soon? So we can see lichens on cars if they're left long enough um, and on all sorts of things. Once we found a couch in a swamp completely covered in the genus Cladonia, I think we found 10 species of Cladonia on that couch then of course dubbed the Cladonia couch. Um, but most lichen species um, do have some level of what we would call substrate preference. So they tend to grow you know, either on bark or on rocks. Um, more lichen species grow on deciduous tree bark than on coniferous tree bark. Um, and actually it's interesting that Andrew, you mentioned the London plane trees because those are one of, you know, because the bark flakes off so much of that tree, uh, so often from that tree, we don't see very many lichens. Yeah, they're really poor substrates for lichens. Um, and so, and really I, our sort of best predictors of high lichen diversity are areas with really stable substrates over long periods of time. And that kind of speaks, speaks to your initial question, Josh, about um, adaptation to urban environments and, um, you know, I, we can't speak too much to like an adaptation from an evolutionary perspective. You know, we don't have any great studies yet looking at, you know, how urbanization really impacts the fungus, the algae, that symbiotic interaction, the whole lichen microbiome. But we do have a pretty good record of research that tells us a lot about how the lichen community uh, communities have changed over time. So especially in New York City, we have some great uh, publications from the early 1800s. There were clearly well over 200 species uh, in what is now New York City at that time, including a lot of species that are fairly rare now, some really lovely large lichens. Um, we saw a really stark decline between the early 1800s and the early 1900s uh, as the city, sort of that built environment uh, came to be. And then an even further decline into the 1960s with really, you know, that horrible um, air period of really poor air quality um, in, in the area. But since then, we you know, we're now in this place of having well over 100 lichen species in the city. Um, and there are some really clear patterns as to who came back, which species actually came back. Uh, we see a lot of nitrophiles, a lot of really disturbance tolerant species. Um, we see a lot of species that can really take advantage of these like nooks and crannies and a lot of species that uh, prefer growing on cement, for instance. So all of these sort of um, anthropogenic substrates uh, that are now in uh, high abundance. Things that we don't see um, are lichens that associate with cyanobacteria as their photosynthetic partner rather than green algae. Uh, we see also see very few of the more shrubby lichens, which we would call fruticose lichens. They tend to be a lot more sensitive to air pollution. James, did you want to jump in on any of that? 
No, I, I think that covers it pretty well. I mean, you know, the the reality is that the lichens that we see in the city mostly are the ones that have managed to adapt to the urban environment and begin to reinvade. Well, you, Andrew, you made the you made the point that you know Central Park is very intentional, and the trees are coming from all over the world, just like the people's in in, in New York City. And, and and sometimes, as we've seen our our history, sometimes that makes for uh, beautiful relationships, and sometimes the uh, the new species coming in uh, doesn't uh, go over as well. So, does that sometimes happen in the insect communities where we get a an outsider, Jessica, that could uh, sometimes have deleterious effects? Oh, for sure. I mean, I think that because we're in, you know, in a port uh, city, we're, we're in an area where there's a lot of shipments coming through, um, we, we, one might wonder, like, how do they actually kind of screen for invasive insects? There are lots, insects and, and humans have been competing for food for as long as there have been humans. <laughs> uh, and so as we pack up food and goods and shipment, um, and they come into the New York Harbor, um, we actually only screen just a tiny percentage of the things that come through, um, because there's just not enough human power to do that job. Um, and so what ends up happening is that we have invasive species. And I, I, I think there's one, I can show a slide, um, that people might have might have heard a little bit about. Um, uh, this is kind of, I guess, there are these times when uh, there's a call to arms for all people, uh, and this is one of them. Uh, so the spotted lanternfly is a recent invader um, that has come to our area. Um, this summer, New Yorkers probably saw a spotted lanternfly, extra, um, and it's gorgeous. I mean, the wings are gorgeous. Um, but you have to, you, you know, don't want, you don't want it to spread. Um, it, it poops, uh, it drinks a, a, a tree sap. Um, so sorry, Andrew, it's basically just, you know, <laughs> its whole goal is to, to drink the sap that, that trees are creating. Um, and as a result, what goes, what goes in must come out. Uh, and the syrupy, uh, sugary poop, um, basically that they that they release, uh, makes a fungus grow, uh, and that fungus can be can be damaging to plants um, and to potentially to crops. So this is just kind of the new invader of the month. Uh, but we've you know we've had brown marmoreded sink bug. We've had many many species that have come um, that are now in what we consider to be established invaders in the United States that came through um, the tri-state area. Does this uh, same idea happen in either uh, the lichens or 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 the the plant communities where we get uh, visitors that are are unwelcome? Uh, James. Uh, so I mean, I'll just say that it's really interesting when you contrast lichens to you know insects or to plants or to so many other groups of organisms where we really do have this serious invasive species problem and non-native species problem uh, because the species are able to apparently move around either on their own or with the help of humans and then become established. Uh, and really with lichens, we don't see that so much because we think they are just, you know, they have such a sensitive sort of uh, obligate relationship between this fungus and the alga, it turns out that when you move them around, by and large, they don't survive. And, mm -hmm. you know, if you, so when you see a lichen growing on a tree in a park or on a rock in a park in New York City, or really any, a street tree anywhere in New York, um, it's a relatively small cohort of species that, you know, over a hundred, but relatively small that have adapted apparently to survive here in one way or another. And we think most of those have recolonized. So, mm -hmm. It's funny because, you know, if you walk down a street, you'll often see some planter with a, a branch that's, you know, covered in big pillowy lichens. Or if you're walking, you know, on the on Chelsea Piers, I was walking over there during the pandemic, and uh, there was a new sculptural installation that had been put in with all these rocks, and the rocks were covered with lichens. Um, and, you know, those are all species that are not native. Well, they would potentially have occurred here in the past. Some of them maybe would not have, but many of them would have. Um, and we don't see them survive. So when you bring a tree in and you mm. plant a tree in front of a new apartment building, um, my I watched this happen in a tree that was put into an apartment building across from my husband's office on 25th, 23rd Street. Um, you know, you can watch and you can see the lichens on the tree slowly disappear. You can guess where the tree came from based on the species that are present. Uh, and then you can watch over a period of months or years and just document them more or less slowly disappear. So it's interesting because it's a, it's one of probably the few groups of organisms 
where what you see around you is pretty much most of the time native, and we don't really have an issue with invasive species because they have this really unique lifestyle that involves specializing to the places where they grow. Mm -hmm. All right. One of the things, you know, there's been a lot of press, you know, for, for years, but certainly the last couple of weeks because of the LAR, the, the, the significant climate conference in Glasgow is what, how has uh, climate change impacted, you know, insect, lichen, and, and tree life in, in this New York City? I don't know who wants to start. Anyone? Sure, I can go for it, Andrew. Give it a shot. Um, yeah, so, so I mean, in, in cities, so we, we have climate change like we do everywhere else in the world, but in cities, we also have something called the urban heat island effect. Um, and that's a, a phenomenon that makes uh, urban areas quite a bit warmer than they would be if they weren't developed urbanized areas. So basically the, the replacement of vegetation, um, which can move large amounts of water from the soil to the atmosphere and sort of acts like the sweatlands of the Earth's surface, um, that process cools things off quite a bit when you remove those trees and you replace them with pavement and buildings that are not transpiring, not cooling off the atmosphere, and instead absorbing huge amounts of incoming solar radiation, that greatly increases temperatures of our city. So like New York City is somewhere between 5 and 10 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than it would be if it wasn't such a dense urbanized area. So we have that, and then on top of that, we have changes in climate, and there's not only work that suggests that um, climate change, it's not going to just have an additive effect with urban heat island effect, but it's actually going to magnify even further the urban heat island effect. Um, and so, you know, what we what we find in in cities and um, is is in a lot of cases where the, the trees that do better in warmer climates um, further to the south will probably do better in, in New York than you might expect them to based on, on the latitude. And there's um, approaches now to do what's called adaptive silviculture, where you're sort of managing urban forests to um, intentionally bring some of those southern species further north that help them adapt to both changes in climate and, um, and, and the urban heat island effect. Um, and I can um, maybe do a screen share really quick and I can just show you um, what I always find a super compelling image of, of how this plays out in a, in a city. Um, so we have these really cool sensors on, on satellites um, that can measure the temperature of the Earth's surface. These are very similar to what we're all familiar with now in the COVID era, those little uh, infrared um, thermometers that we point at our heads. This is sort of a glorified version of that on a satellite. Um, and here we can see Manhattan. And in this image, the darker the red, the hotter the the temperatures and you can very clearly see Central Park here pop out as this like oasis of, of coolness. Well, coolness, I guess, in the cultural sense and coolness in, in, the, in the climate sense. And when we zoom in a little bit, you can see that that sort of cooler colored box really closely corresponds to this block of vegetation that's there com compared to the surrounding landscape. Um, here's a, just an area that's zoomed in. Uh, the different shades of green indicate how much vegetation is in different locations. And you can see that that pairs pretty well with variations in, in, in temperature. So it's this interesting dynamic where cities being hotter and climate change are influencing the trees. They're putting these trees in conditions where they're being stressed out more frequently than they would be if they, wouldn't, if they weren't in a city. And that can adversely impact carbon sequestration and other important services that we expect from our trees. Um, but there's also this important feedback in the other direction where the trees and other plants by doing what they're doing and cooling off the, the earth's surface, they're actually helping to regulate in some ways the climate system of an urban area and provide a bit of refuge for its people too during, during uh, heat waves and especially also during, during the pandemic. How about with uh, insects, Jessica? Well, I mean, I think globally what we're seeing is catastrophic insect decline. And what we mean by that is that when we look at the insects um, that are present in specific environments where people have done long-term studies, we see that they're lower biomass, like lower total mass of insects in the area. We don't really know um, 
species turnover and whether it's just that um, you know the the individual species that make up these communities are changing or not. Uh, but what entomologists would say anecdotally without having um, done, there haven't really been very many long-term empirical studies on, on insect decline. What we would say is that we're seeing fewer insects. And this is true in Manhattan. This is true in the tri-state area. Um, and it's in part, you know, because of pesticide use, it's in part because of land use. Uh, many people uh, were anxiously awaiting the emergence of brood 10 uh, cicadas, which have long been, um, you know, basically locally extinct in Manhattan. Um, and this is just one of many insects that we that we don't uh, find in the numbers that we would otherwise predict. Even the, the dragonfly, uh, which, you know, we have over 80 species in, in, in New York City, um, we found very few of them. So the actual number of individuals in a population is really poorly known for most insect species. Amy Savage, who's a professor at Rutgers uh, in Camden, she did work on ants in New York City, and I think she estimated there was something like 16 billion ant, uh, you know, ants in in the area uh, of 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 the five boroughs. Um, but I mean, it, those are it's rare to have those types of numbers for most insect populations. We really have no idea how big the populations are, so it's really hard to know the impact of of climate change on populations. But what we know is that there's fewer, uh, and we should be concerned. Similarly, I mean, this kind of relates a little bit to what maybe what Andrew was saying. Um, you know, part of the reason why there's a heat island effect is because um, also we constantly have things like lights um, on all the time. We have electricity burning all the time. That actually can dramatically impact insects that are at night flying insects. So many insects are nocturnal um, and they actually require darkness so that they can signal or communicate with their mates. So for example, things like fireflies um, have a species specific flashing pattern. Um, and if it's really, really bright and people have you know lights and street lights and the lights in their building and every light in their apartment on, um, it just makes it harder for for, for individuals to find each other. So in general, I think the choices that we've made over the last 200 years or so have kind of set a bleak um, future for insects. And there's, a, and there's a lot of catch up that we can try and do, but I think uh, if you're not alarmed, um, you should be alarmed. <laughs> you should be alarmed and, and really do what you can to try and support policies that will uh, you know, quickly and, and promptly address insect decline. So that, that kind of brings to two two important issues. Is one issue that Jessica talked about is the loss of numbers of species or species diversity because maybe one species is more adapted to the urban environment than another. What, what is the you know how are things happening in in diversity in, in urban environments and lichens and trees, and what is the the impact of the loss of the diversity? I could dive in a bit there and uh, maybe James, you could also follow up for, with some things. Um, yeah, so, you know, we, as I mentioned earlier on in the webinar, you know, we, we saw this very clear pattern of decline in lichens, some recovery, some reestablishment. Um, and this, you know, and we'll probably continue to see changes. You know, climate change certainly impacts lichens like it does many other groups of organisms. Uh, we're maybe in a somewhat of a similar situation with insects where we're working with a really understudied group. And so we start from basic biodiversity um, studies of what species exist here. And so we now have somewhat of a baseline for New York um, and, a, and also for the Mid-Atlantic Coastal Plain. That was a project led by James. Um, and so, um, you know, so as far as what will happen in the future, at least we have a little bit of a baseline there. Um, and so, you know, what does what does the loss of lichens mean? Uh, in what does the loss of lichen mean, lichens mean in these urban areas, and specifically in New York, and also their return? Well, um, you know, lichens interact with a lot of animals, many insects. For instance, you know, many invertebrates use lichens as camouflage, as food. Um, birds use them as nesting material. Larger mammals eat them. So, you know, they're integrally um, woven into these food webs. So I would say the return of lichens can only mean good things for other groups of organisms. And anyone else want to jump in? And I, one thing I would like to remind the audience is please, we're going to, in the next segment, uh, answer some of your questions. So if you have them, please uh, pop them into the Q&A. 
I think. Yeah, I can um, chime Sorry. in a couple of quick thoughts about the the, the tree piece. So I'll just, um, as a visual aid here, kind of go back to what I was showing before. So in, you know, in, in, in cities, we, we have like this highly fragmented nature of our vegetated areas. Um, and that means that there's a lot more, a lot more light being exposed to, to our forests um, along, along edges. We find that that higher light, um, when we study these fragmented systems, can generally be a good thing for tree growth and, and forest growth. Um, street trees, for example, can grow twice as fast as the same tree in a forest in a rural area. We find that these fragmented forests also grow considerably faster than an intact forest. But we're also finding that sort of this combination of fragmentation and urbanization makes these forests more sensitive to heat and, and climate. So there's that interact, interaction with, with climate change. Um, but the other thing that that higher exposure to light means and that greater disturbance near these edges means is that there's room for um, all, all sorts of different invasive uh, plants and other organisms to, to get into our forests. And, and so while maybe for, for other organisms, there, maybe there's lower diversity than we would expect um, if New York City were more of a natural landscape, we actually have a higher diversity uh, in a lot of ways, of certainly of trees and maybe of, of other plants too, than we would expect if it was a natural landscape. Um, and most of these are, are from, from other places. So um, up here on the right, this is an example of, of a vineland. This is can be uh, a invasive vine called porcelain berry or another invasive vine called bittersweet. And the disturbed nature of a lot of urban forests coupled with the high light environments allows these things to proliferate. Um, and when they're doing this, they're doing it at the expense of trees. This would ordinarily be a forest, but these vines grow so thick that it, it creates sort of what we call arrested succession where a forest can't develop in its place. It has really important implications for carbon and other ecosystem services. Um, the other thing that I'll point out is, is even with our trees, we get a lot of non-native trees trees in our forest. So as an example, this is actually from Boston. We would find the same thing in New York, where there may have been a, a forest dominated by native oaks, but um, Norway maple are really good at invading these forests. Um, and they can functionally change what the forest does. So here I'm using satellite imagery and I'm showing you when in the spring the trees leaf out. Um, the bluer the color, the later, the redder the color, the earlier. And you can see that our native forest are leafing out a couple of weeks um, later than the forest dominated by invasive species. So it's not just a change in diversity, but there's also potentially this important change in, in functionality. I also have a picture of an earthworm here that alters carbon and nutrient cycling in, in the forest and can change what types of species can regenerate in, in the forest by altering the structure of the forest floor, but that can be a, a whole other conversation. So with, with plants and trees, um, it may not necessarily be that there's a decline in diversity, but there's a real change in, in who's there. And there's also a whole suite of invasive insects that are uh, killing uh, many of our, our, of our native trees like, like Eastern hemlock. And Jessica, you, you made another comment and I kind of want to, and before we open it up to the Q and A section, uh, that's a little bit more hopeful where you said, you know, we should be uh, figuring out ways to, to save insects or save planets and stuff. So what are some ways in which uh, people can advocate for positive change to help species diversity or preserve uh, ecosystems in which they encounter in, in, their, in, their, in their lives? Well, one thing that can be intimidating, but I think it's something that we can all do is science policy. So I think the idea that, you know, you have to have some type of special credentials to be able to reach out to your representative, is a, it's false, right? Any of us can call our representatives, whether it's our local representatives or whether it's people in the state and tell them the things that are important to them uh, or they're important to you. I think that can be a really good first step because although there are lots of things that we can do locally in terms of the things that we plant, you can have a butterfly garden on your fire escape you can do you can make decisions on how often you drive to the store but um, in terms of some big dollar um, you know support behind initiatives uh, for to prevent climate change and species loss uh, you know you know reaching out to your local um, you know representatives I think can be really impactful all right so now I'm going to turn to some of the questions that uh, our audience has provided to us. And we're going to start off with with the lichens. One, and I'll, I'm going to, going to concatenate two of the questions: is where do lichens uh, kind of fall in the food chain, and are are lichens always symbiotic with their host, 
or do they uh, sometimes have negative effects on their hosts? So we'll start with you, James, you wanna get that one? Sure, so I'll take that. Uh, so first of all, lichens are everywhere in the food chain, uh, so to speak, because they really are hubs of the ecosystem. Like they are involved in so many interactions with so many different things, you know, between, be it animals of all sizes from very small ones to very, very large mammals eating them, using them as nesting materials, you know, small insects using them as camouflage, these tiny little worms and, and invertebrates that live inside of them. You know, they're, they're used by animals in that all sorts of ways. Plants also rely on them in a lot of different ways. So they have this really fantastic ability to kind of mediate the temperature and moisture of the environment around them. And that can be really important to seedlings of plants, um, to germination. It can also be really important, obviously, to on many of these like small, uh, fleshy body invertebrates. Uh, they don't like to get too hot and they don't like to dry out. Uh, and then just in generally, they have all these all sorts of important roles in the environment. So lichens are sort of like, I, I imagine like if you just put a picture of a forest on the screen, the lichens are at the center of it. But also I'm obviously highly biased. No. <laughs> and then- we, we, we all have our biases and understood why. And that's true. Um, the other thing is that, uh, you know, this is actually a common misconception about lichens. I, I get this question about whether they're harming or, in, or interacting really with the trees that they grow on uh, from a lot of people, including, you know, arborists. And I've, I've spoken with the Ag Extension folks in Suffolk County, uh, and I've spoken at arborist conferences about this, really to convey the fact that they do not harm the trees and woody substrates that they're growing on. The lichens have these algae inside of them, which provide them with the nutrition they need. They have all of the nutrients, they're, all of the nutrients they're getting more or less, they get from inside of them. They have structures that look like little roots, but they aren't roots. They're just attachment organs so that they attach to whatever they're growing on. So they're either glued on with the sort of glue that they make, or they have these little attachment organs, but they don't actually interact directly with their tree substrates or their bark substrates, and they don't actually have anything, any kind of interplay with them. So they don't damage the trees at all. You know, we, we've all gone through what, you know, recently is us, you can consider a natural experiment. Following in, in March, 2020, spring buds were happening. There was a large decrease in traffic patterns because people weren't commuting anywhere. They were just sheltering at home. And then I have the feeling that traffic patterns are increasing now as people are hesitant to return to mass transit. So how has increased, presumably that increases uh, fossil fuel emissions in our local environment. Are we seeing an impact on insects, trees, or lichens? I don't know who wants to start. Jessica, you wanna, you wanna start? Yeah, we don't have that data for insects. We definitely don't. So unfortunately, uh, although there are over a million species of insects that have been described, um, uh, we actually have just a teeny tiny number of people working on insects and no one's really monitoring populations. Um, I shouldn't say that. There are a few people monitoring populations, but often it's not in urban centers uh, and certainly not in New York City. So uh, we don't we don't know. Do we know anything about the trees or the lichens over the past year or so? So the the trees, I don't I don't know that there's really been uh, much of a of a noticeable impact. I mean, at least like in Manhattan, like a lot of dense urban centers, there's kind of this curious thing where the highest amounts of ozone pollution, which is one of the most damaging pollutants to, for trees, is really really low in the urban center and is actually highest in like the surrounding suburbs or here some of the um, the outer boroughs, and it's it's has to do with this weird atmosphere chemistry dynamic where you kind of need volatile organic carbon in the presence of sunlight um, and nitrogen oxides in the atmosphere, which we get from cars to, to produce ozone. And um, really like the main source of those volatile organic carbons in, in cities these days would be trees, but we don't have a whole lot of them. And so what winds up happening instead is the NOx emitted from automobiles can actually just scavenge ozone from the atmosphere. And so you get really low level levels of ozone in the center of the city and it winds up just being highest out in, in the suburbs. So if there's increased traffic having an effect, maybe it's in the in the suburban areas uh, in the outskirts where, where you would where you would see that. And any thoughts, right, how the changes in dynamics has impact in do the pandemic has impacted the lichens in New York City? 
So this is actually a question that, that some of us were really interested in trying to get at when the pandemic first hit, because, you know, that drop in vehicular traffic and the corresponding drop in pollution was really dramatic uh, in many places, not just in New York City. And, you know, I think that if that that uh, drop had been sustained, it's likely that we would see a response over time. But the reality is that, you know, the, the lifespan of lichens, even if they're relatively short lived, is longer than this event has been for the most part. So it's really hard to say, you know, in the short term, whether that that brief drop uh, will result in a corresponding change in abundance or colonization of new species, or if this sort of blip in the amount of air pollution and vehicular traffic followed subsequently by what Certainly, any I, I, I take the train, but I also have friends that drive. And I will tell you, anyone that drives on the FDR to go to work on a weekday knows that there's more traffic. So um, it certainly feels like it. And I, I just I wouldn't be surprised if the levels of air pollution are going up even potentially more so than they were before. It feels like there's more cars on the road. Um, and so it's possible that we're going to see impacts from that long term on the lichens, if that's a sustained trend, or if eventually it equalizes out to what we had before the pandemic. I think it's just one of those things where we'll have to study that and see how it changes over time. So, so Jessica, one of our uh, audience was inspired by your idea of a butterfly garden on, uh, on, on a fire escape. So do you have any suggestions for them? Obviously not this time of year, but come spring next year on what to plant out there so they could see some butterflies. Oh yeah, actually, uh, you don't need to have a lot of space um, and you can just do these in small containers. Uh, and I would definitely plant um, echinacea or coneflower. That's something the butterflies really love. There are like smaller versions of butterfly bushes. That's um, a native plant, it's called butterfly weed. You can buy butterfly bushes. It's some people who study plants say it's an invasive and we, and we should kind of manage how much butterfly bush we plant. But butterfly weed is a native uh, plant that you can plant. Really anything, any type of flower that has um, some type of nectar um, repository in it. And often you can see things like columbine is another one that you can plant on your fire escape. Um, they often will have like um, almost what looks like a little, like a little cup or a little cylinder as part of the flower. Um, and that's where the sugar, uh, the sugary solution is. Anything that has something like that usually will do well for butterflies. Um, but it also will attract, in, there are flies that are pollinators. Um, of course, bees will come. So uh, if you build it, they'll come. Um, they're very good at finding nectar. So uh, any, actually, even just some garden centers have butterfly mixes now that you can get. And the way that they describe them on the little packages uh, makes it seem like you have to have a big lawn or a big swath. You don't. You can plant those in a, in a small pot and they do just fine. So we've done that. Uh, in many, many places um, to get little small urban butterfly gardens going. Cool. So, you know, we talked a little bit about, you know, species diversity being good. And then we also said, well, you get invasive species, which is diversity in another uh, dimension, and that could be bad. So how do you balance diversity versus ridding the, the ecosystem of some sort of invasive species? Anyone want to take that one? It's tricky. I mean, some, some of these invasives, it will always be an uphill battle to try and get rid of them. And, and, and so there's some growing movement of thought that we need to figure out how to just live with the ones that are here. Um, I think, you know, if we're managing these landscapes, we need to think about, well, what, what, are, what, are, what do we want these ecosystems to be doing for us? What do we want them to be providing? If it's carbon sequestration, then having a vineland there is not a good thing. If it's um, attracting birds um, or wildlife or, or insects, then having um, you know a forest or a vegetative area of non-native plants that are native species don't really know what to do with is also not a good thing. But if you have waste areas and abandoned lots that are going to be vacant and devoid of any sort of vegetation in the absence of what we would consider to be invasive species, then maybe there's there's a place or a way to have have tolerance for them. So it's it's never really like a binary good bad question. I just think you know in urban systems where we put so much effort into managing our ecosystems, we just need to really think what do we want these ecosystems to be providing for us, and and how much effort is it going to take? How much financial and personnel effort is it going to take to get us there? And you know what are the kind of pros and cons of of doing these sorts of things? 
James, you had a thought? I mean, I think this follows really nicely uh, from that. Uh, so, you know, the, the, with, from the lichen perspective, it's really important to remember that what we see on the trees and rocks around us are these things that have managed to come back into the city. They've managed to apparently adapt and recolonize the city. And so, you know, something that we found really clearly is that the highest lichen diversity is often in what we would call wild areas. So, you know, the High Line is a really great example of this. There's no lichens. There, there, there were lichens there when it was a completely unused train line. There were not that many of them. But we know that a fair number of species have come back. But now all those species that come back are only found on the small one block long area that remains as it was undisturbed after the trains stopped running. So there is no lichens growing on the rest of the High Line. We think that has something to do with just the quantity of people that come through and really probably you know, rub all the surfaces bare, more or less. Um, but for whatever reason, it's this one little wild patch that's been left to sort of just continue being the way it is and to continue to exist uh, and change as the environment around it changes. That's allowed the that has been a place where these lichens have recolonized. And so you know we often really think about managing our urban areas um, and natural areas are often highly managed in cities. But, you know, it's really important to remember that if we're looking for things that have been able to adapt to the future scenarios of the planet, you know, whatever it's going to look like, it's going to look more like this. And so those things are surviving sometimes only in those wild areas. And if we manage them too much, we potentially lose the few individuals that have managed to adapt to what are potentially the future conditions that they'll need to survive. You know, one thing we, we, we've been do doing tonight is sometimes just talking about lichens and the trees and the insects independent of each other. But ultimately there's an entire ecosystem where there's interrelationships between these different species. And then obviously, much larger species that we weren't we 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 were ignoring today. Sorry, squirrels, rats, and 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 flying birds. But um, what are the ways in which these different organisms communicate, or do they just not talk to each other? Well, there's lots of herbivores. I mean, there's lots of insect herbivores that really rely on the fauna of Central Park. Um, and in turn, to speak to the people who are looking for some, for some vertebrate content, uh, you know, the, the, herb, the plant life kind of supports the insects and the insects kind of can be really good food for stop for birds that are doing kind of a stopover uh, in their long distance migration. And there's a lot of work that shows that, you know, uh, parts of Manhattan and even lowly Newark, New Jersey uh, are like rich sources of, of fat um, and, and sugar uh, for migrating birds. So they definitely are, are interacting, like you say, um, you know, uh, from, you know, predators like like birds and, and, and dragonflies um, down to, to herbivores and detritivores. Um, the reason why we don't have to triple um, a bunch of dead rats every time we walk through Central Park is thank you to beetles. Thank you to all of the insects that are doing the decomposition um, in Central Park. So um, there really is a lot of interaction across trophic levels. Cool. Any other thoughts? Yeah, and the lichens are, you know, helping to support those insects as well. And as along with the birds, along with the small mammals, though, I do suspect that the, the mammals in the city prefer the garbage over the lichens. Um, but in more natural settings, they would also be um, in taking the lichens as a food source. Well, I want to thank uh, James, Jesse, Jessica, and Andrew for an absolutely stimulating discussion. I would like to thank our audience for tuning in. And remember, if you missed this or if you have a friend that you wish had seen this, uh, we'll be posting the video in a few days. Uh, and if you're a registrant, you'll get a, a link to that video. 
So please uh, spread the word and we hope to see you at our City of Science events uh, next spring so we can follow Jessica's advice, learn a little bit about science and then reach out to your public officials to help advocate for science-based policies that can help things like urban ecosystems. And until then, a very happy Thanksgiving. And remember, if you're looking for a late Christmas book, James and Jesse's Lichen book will be out uh, early, uh, late this month, I believe. Oh, there it is, urban lichens. All right, thank you very much and good night.